I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities that we have as we get out and place and distribute the Word of God in the many different traffic lanes of life that God has ordained for us to get His Word out. You know, in His Word, He tells us to go out into the highways and byways and compel them because there's plenty of room at the table. If you were to think about, even right now, the different opportunities for placement and distribution in your camp, think about how many there might be. What would you say? Schools? medical facilities, hospitals, maybe a jail, prison, doctor's offices. You might be able to name five, maybe six. Did you know that there are 56 different approved areas for placement and distribution right here in the United States? 17 of those are specific to the auxiliary alone. We have so many different opportunities. You probably aren't aware of them all. You might not have all of those in your local camp, but there's, <laughs> there's a probability there's quite a few. And so do take note of what's available right in your own community. Sometimes we get inspired and fired up and we think about what's happening around the world in a lot of these third world countries, but God has called each of us to the mission field that's right here in our own backyard, in our own communities. The pastor was talking about evangelism and the need for evangelism right in the local churches. Last year, we surveyed some 80,000 pastors across the whole country and asked them what's most important to them. What are their pain points? What are they looking for? Some 1,200 of those responded. And what we saw consistently across the board was their heart's desire for evangelism in their own communities, and citing that as a great need for their own ministries. And helping. So we need to take our job seriously. We need to get out there and make sure that we're doing the very best that we can. As I've served on staff, I've had the great privilege of traveling through an airport some 900 times in the last six years or so. A lot of different states, and I've gotten to see God's hand all on this ministry and how he's honoring his word. He's honoring not only the placement and the distribution, but he's honoring the approach of just simply wanting to see people come to know Jesus. As I've looked at the numbers nationwide and even around the world, last year, by God's grace, we were able to give out 97 million copies of the Word of God right here in the United States, 11.4 million in this country alone. I like the numbers because the numbers, the statistics, the data, they tell a story. And so I'm looking at all these different numbers and thinking, wow, God, where are you using us? How are you getting your Word out? In this country alone, our number one scripture is that Orange Testament, the Sidewalk Youth Testament. Some three million of those went out last year. Right after that, the second one is the green one, that College Testament. Colleges, universities, post-secondary schools, almost two million of those went out. So if you do the math, just the orange and the green alone, that's five million. That's almost half of all of our scriptures by volume. Where are they going? They're going into the hands of students, the young people. And I praise God that he's using us to reach this next generation. It's tough for the next generation. I don't have to tell you that. But guess where our third largest market segment is, our, our mar largest volume by population? It might surprise you. It's in the population of the prisons and jails. In the United States, we have seen explosive growth in population of those that are incarcerated. From the 70s, it went from some 300,000 to today, the estimation is over 2.3 million people behind bars somewhere in the United States. If I were to kind of help paint a picture, what does that mean? Well, we've got about 5% of the world's population living here in the United States. Only 5%, one out of 20 people in the world live here. But one out of four people that are incarcerated anywhere in the world are incarcerated right here in this country. So again, we have 5% of the world's population, but almost 25% of the world's incarcerated population. That's a huge amount of people, and God is using this ministry to get into those places. Some 2 million facilities testaments. We can't even count the soft cover uh, used Bibles that are going into those prisons and jails. In my travels, God has graced me to go into some of the largest and no most notorious maximum security prisons and jails. Places like San Quentin and Folsom. Angola down in Louisiana, the big three jails of Rikers Island in New York City, Chicago's Cook County Jail, Los Angeles County Jail. And what an honor that is to see how God is penetrating even into the deepest, darkest walls of these prison environments. I want to tell you a story of God's faithfulness. In these travels, I've gotten to see these different facilities, and they look so different. Some of them are old and almost dilapidated. In, in California, you've got these old prisons like San Quentin, built in 1858. 
Imagine this facility, it's still using lock and key. They don't even have electric locks on the cell doors. It's kind of like Alcatraz. And you're looking at these places and you're thinking, wow, how can they still even be in existence? Well, about 19 years ago, California opened up a newer prison called Salinas Valley State Prison. And you might think, wow, it's 19 years old, it's kind of old, but that's new for the California Department of Corrections. Out of all of the populations in the country, all the prisons that are overcrowding in all of these different states, California's got the most people, it's got the highest population, it's also got the highest population of inmates. And so these older prisons, they saw this new prison, they said, wow, this is our chance, let's flush these guys out, let's get the worst of the worst out of here. And they sent them to that new prison in Central California called Salinas Valley in Soledad. And so it literally became the end of the line for the California Department of Corrections. Imagine the worst of the worst offenders. Now once they get to Salinas Valley, they actually put all the worst inmates that are the most violent ones, they put them on a single yard, the most violent yard, C yard, Charlie yard. This yard is so bad, National Geographic did a documentary on C yard in Salinas Valley State Prison. In a single year, they had 1,500 violent incidents on this one yard. Brothers, do the math. That's about four a day, four violent incidents every day. It's so bad they had to install a helicopter pad on the compound. They're life flighting these inmates on and off. I mean, the gangs are just so bad. and They're segregated by these race-based gangs, and they're so organized. They've got these generals and shot callers and foot soldiers and associates. And so God opens this door for us to get into there and, and to place the word of God. And so we went to Salinas Valley and began to pray and say, Lord, is this where you want us to go? And he said, yes, go. And when we get there, we had no idea the level that we were getting into. I mean, it had been on lockdown for 14 years without any volunteer access into this yard. And so I'm there and we're going through this training and the sergeants and the, the corporals are there, the chaplains there. And they said, Brother Reza, we just want to let you know that not if, but when something happens, we've got gunners and we're going to shoot down live ammunition onto the yard. And so we need you to back up to the wall because we don't want to shoot you by accident. <laughs> Not only that, but we've got tear gas and we're going to throw this tear gas out onto the yard when these fights and riots break out. So we need you to pay attention to which way the wind's blowing because that tear gas is going to get on you too. And I thought, Lord, <laughs> this is where you're sending us? And the Lord says, yes, go. And so through prayer and fervent prayer and walking by faith and even walking through a, a, a great, tremendous spiritual battle, we went out onto that yard. And I've got to tell you, when we entered the yard, it was tense because these gangs, they're looking at us and they're thinking, who are you? We're, we're impeding on their property because even in an open yard, they've got these invisible boundaries. They can't cross these boundaries or they end up taking each other out and we're going in onto their territory. And by God's grace, not only were we able to go out there, but we were given a loudspeaker and a microphone. And we were able to pro proclaim the word of God, a message of hope and peace and restoration, that there's a God in heaven that loved them, that there was an opportunity for them to receive Jesus. And as God began to move, we did a two-hour session in the morning, 9 to 11, another two-hour session, 1 to 3 in the afternoon. And we started seeing those inmates come and cross those invisible boundaries to come forward to pray and dedicate or rededicate their life to the Lord, even with tears flowing down their faces. And by the afternoon session, I looked around and, and I began to think, wow, there's no gunshots, no violence, no stabbings, no tear gas, no war zone that I was expecting. So I began to talk with one of the inmates. I said, wow, this is pretty, pretty amazing, huh? He said, yeah, Reza, you want me to tell you what happened? I said, yeah, please. He said, yesterday, the generals of these gangs found out that you guys were coming onto the yard today. And for the first time ever, they got word through their associates to communicate to one another. And they called a truce just for the day. Had never happened before. Now, brothers, I don't know if that speaks to you the way it speaks to me, but our God is sovereign. We serve a mighty God. He moved on the hearts of the generals of the most violent gangs and the most violent prison yard in this country to protect his people to come in and proclaim the word of God. We have to be faithful when God opens those doors. And so we're seeing God transform cultures and assault rates that are going down. The last time we checked with the, the uh, prison there, they 
shared with us that they're on track to hit about 800 violent incidents in a year. <laughs> Still bad, but it's almost half. You cannot put the word of God in of even the most darkest and oppressive place and not see God on the move. So we were sharing these stories of what God is doing around the country and all of these different facilities and opportunities that we have to share the word of God. This past year, just a few months ago, we had an opportunity to present a dignitary Bible to the commissioner over the entire state of Georgia's Department of Corrections. And during that luncheon, we had about 20 minutes to share these stories, and we were sharing what God is doing. And God moved on the heart of the head commissioner of operations. And afterwards, he comes up to me, big man, <laughs> shakes my hand real firm, says, Reza, thank you. We appreciate you sharing those stories. I heard what you said. We're going to give you guys access to all of our prisons throughout the state of Georgia. I said, sure, sir, yes, sir, no problem. <laughs> Sounds great. He said, no, no. I don't think you understand. We have 33 prisons. Ten of them are what we call tier two prisons. They're the high max, super max, high lockdown, 23-hour day units. I'm over all the wardens, and when I say something goes, it's going to go. The director of chaplains came up to me afterwards. He said, brother, you don't understand. We've been trying to get any kind of volunteers access to these prisons for years and to no avail. And I'm friends with these commissioners. They hired me. You came down and, and God's stories touched that man's heart, God's faithfulness. And now we've got access to all of them. And so in the past four months, we've launched 10 new prison ministries and all these tier two prisons across the entire state of Georgia. They're most violent, high lockdown prisons. 10 new ministries where the local Gideons are going in regularly, weekly, bi-weekly, monthly to visit them, including the Georgia Diagnostic and Classification Prison, which houses the death row inmates. And the latest that we've heard, some 225 inmates have now prayed to receive Jesus as a result of these prisons. It's amazing. It's God. God is not playing when it comes to his word. God doesn't play when it comes to drawing. He leaves no stone unturned when it comes to getting his word where it needs to go. Amen. And so our job is to be faithful. And as we follow the Lord, he goes before us. He fights those battles and we get to walk by faith and see him get all the honor and glory knowing that he is strong even in our weaknesses. I was just reading the testimony two days ago. One of those Gideon brothers sent in that testimony from the Georgia death row unit. And he said, finally, one of the death row inmates broke down and prayed to receive Jesus as his Savior. So only eternity will reveal the fruit. But as we abide in the vine and as we're faithful to go to where God has called us to go, we know that there will be fruit. And there will be fruit that remains because God honors his word. So my encouragement to you today, as you think about these many different traffic lanes in your camp, as you think about the different opportunities to reach into the students, to go into these medical units, to maybe go into a prison or a jail, or to just look for those opportunities daily to plant and water seeds as we're proclaiming the word of God. Know as the Lord leads you, he's going to be faithful. And he's going to take you on that journey. <laughs> what a marvelous journey it is, and how humbling it is that he calls us into this work. And so let's run the race. And let's run it with endurance. Amen. May God bless you, brothers.